Hello and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a black sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And this is our season three wrap. And we have our extra special guest who does our reps with us now. Now it's a tradition. It is. Um, I love it. <laughs> so yes, we have Lauren Sarner. Say hi, Lauren. And then I'm going to talk about you. Hi, everyone. Good to be back. Thanks for having me. So this is Lauren's special season, or that's how I look at it, because <laughs> I first found Lauren because she was covering season three for Inverse.com. And anyone who hasn't read her articles needs to go read them now. Now that you've all seen season three, go back and read all of them. They're amazing. Um, I don't, Lauren, was it official? I mean, definitely the thesis statement game was inspired by you. <laughs> uh, because I used to love to watch the show and then see, but you, did you do it as a proper thesis statement? I just remember like wanting, like at the when I would read your article, like seeing if we kind of came up with the same thing by the end. Like, what did? How did you? you what did you call it? It wasn't a thesis statement. I was gonna say I didn't do exactly what you did in terms of picking out a line and saying this is the thesis statement. Um, I would sometimes say this episode is about X, and then talk about like the ways. Uh, like I remember talking the dual episode. I think I said this episode is about like kings and their kingdoms, and talked about the different mm-hmm. ways that's kind of oh, reflected yeah. with like Jack and Blackbeard. Um, and I, I, I kind of like separate because Black Sails is kind of a complicated show to <laughs> discuss. Like you guys are very lucky that you can <laughs> n- take all the little details because you get you know an hour and a half. I can't right. really <laughs> hand in like you know like fifty thousand words to my editor. They'd be like, yeah, right, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> So I would I, be happy if you did that. Yeah. <laughs> so I organize my write-ups in like, I have these little kind of subsections that allow me to kind of pick out like patterns that each episode does and pick out the most interesting things in each episode to talk about. But yeah, this is why I've really enjoyed listening to you guys too, because you get to talk about the details that I wasn't able to linger on, unfortunately. Right. Yes, yeah. we, ling- we linger and linger for sure. We do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> No apologies. So yeah, so everyone should go back and read those articles. So there's an episode, you did each episode, but you also had really great interviews with the showrunners yeah. and with some of the actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got an extra one with Zach, right? You had two with yeah, Zach? I, that was not planned. I interviewed him twice. So I'm thinking two with Zach McGowan. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, it, it was weird. My first interview with him basically ended up being an accidental eulogy for Vane that was not planned. Because mm. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, I'll just start with him because I was really impressed with Vane's character arc in season two. Um, and so I basically just wanted to write an article about how great Vane was as a character. And then I was uh-huh. like, you know what? This would be a more interesting article if I could talk to the guy who plays him. Like, I mm-hmm. sure hope he's eloquent. Otherwise, it won't work. <laughs> and then it, he turned out to be really eloquent. Uh, and that's kind of why my interviews are the way they are. They're kind of like a profile of that character that kind mm-hmm. of happened by accident because I like had written half that article and was like, oh, I guess I should talk to Zach. <laughs> <laughs> Um, rather than just being a straight Q and A, and I was like, oh, I like doing this, especially because mm. you can for these characters because they're so complex. Yeah, so it's really fun. Yeah, you also you talk to Luke, right? Who else? Who else did I you did. interview? I did. I talked to Luke twice now, also because I talked to him at Comic Con for season four. Right. Yeah, we covered some similar things that you guys covered with him. Uh, that was I loved your interview with him. That was great. Oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to Toby Schmitz as well, and uh, Ray Stevenson too at the beginning. Oh, right. Oh, I want to talk to Ray Stevenson someday. (laughs) You know, it's funny because everyone's like, how do you talk to these people? Don't you get like really excited or anything like that? Because I am a huge fan of the show, as you know. Of course. And I say, you know, um, the only one I felt a little bit intimidated by. uh, And I say, I bet you'll never guess. And it was Ray Stevenson. And you know why? Because everyone else, when you're on the phone with them, they don't sound a thing like their characters, either because oh. either because they have different accents, or right. in his case, his, whole, his voice sounds completely different. Whereas Ray Stevenson is, well, I've seen him play a lot of scary characters, and yeah. his voice uh-huh. sounds exactly the same. So it did feel like you're on the phone with his characters. <laughs> that's so funny. See, that's also funny for me, because I, get, I talked about this in the beginning of this season. Like, for me, my first experience of him was in Rome and Titus Pillow oh, uh-huh. is uh, a 
dangerous character, but also kind of a big teddy bear. Oh, uh huh, sure. So yeah. I mean, I wasn't at all surprised that he was capable of being so terrifying as Teach, mm-hmm. but it, but it's like I'm less afraid of him maybe because for me he's always been Titus Polo, who's just this like sure you know warrior sweetheart character. <laughs> Warrior sweetheart, I like that. Did either of you two ever see the um, King Arthur movie starring Clive Owen as King Arthur? Forever ago when it was in theaters, yes. Yes, forever ago. Wait, is Uh, he in that? Does he play Gawain? Who does he play? He plays, uh, I can't remember his name, but he's basically, he's the only actor who looks like he's having any fun in that movie. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Fair. So I noticed him in that, uh, because it's so Uh dark. Like, Clive Owen's a very good actor, but just the movie itself is so unnecessarily dour. It was grim, yes. But Ray Stevenson is kind of the Charles Vane of the Knights. Um, mm-hmm. Like, he's just this really fun, kind of crazy character, and he kind of, uh, spoiler alert, dies very dramatically uh, before everyone else does. Vague recollections of this. <laughs> and so I noticed him in that, and ever since, like, I used to watch Dexter, he was in that long after the show. Oh, right. Yeah, he was a great villain in that. Uh, Oh, right, right, right. Oh, my goodness. I had forgotten about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it was interesting, Liz, when you were talking about how you didn't necessarily like Blackbeard at first, uh, because I had the opposite reaction, uh, because he's kind of the only situation where I actually went in with, I guess I call it actor bias, where you've seen the person in something else before. So yeah. like, oh, I automatically am set up to like this character. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. See, I had the same. That's what I had said. I had the same because of Titus mm-hmm. Pullo. Yeah, exactly. And you said you liked Wood Rogers right away, and I was like, oh, I'm not sure about him. So we had opposite reactions to those two characters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I did like Woods Rogers from the beginning. Liz also loved Vane from the beginning, which you and I, I Lauren, did love Vane. Not the nuts about Vane from That's the beginning. That's right. Yeah. So many people, and I really am. It seems like um, I really am in the minority on that. It seems like not many people like Vane in the beginning at all. But minute one, I just thought he was fascinating and so much fun to watch. Yeah. See, I I just want to do some sort of some sort of sociological study of people who love Vane from the beginning and people who don't like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious. I mean, there must be people who don't like Flint from the beginning. There I don't are, think actually. I've met many, but um, yeah, there've got to be, right? Yeah, I, I yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine who I had recommended the show to, and he was like, "I got pretty far into it, I think, and I just never came around." And there, after there was a point where I could tell they were trying to make me like somebody, and I was like, "I just am never gonna like you." Uh-huh. And I came to realize they watched through the murder of Gates. And never came around on Flint. And I was like, well, then it's not your show. I don't just yeah. tell you. <laughs> like, you no, might as well stop true. now. If, that, if you didn't come around on Flint by then, then there's no hope for you, probably. Right. I mean, maybe by halfway through season two. But you need to like him by then for even that turn to work for you. Right. No, totally. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine. I'm, I think I'm just it's you know, hard to basically imagine, right? programmed to love Flint from the very beginning. Yeah, he is, he is the character I love. Yeah. It's just, he, I have a type. <laughs> Well, part of it's also that he is just such good acting, and it might just be if you're the kind of person who watches a show for good acting, as opposed to right. the kind of person who watches a show for characters who are quote-unquote likable. Um, right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, That's just fair. whatever appeals to your tastes as a viewer. Mm-hmm. Right. No, it's true. I mean, I need to be able to identify with the... Not identify with. I need to sympathize. I need to right. feel... Yeah. I need to care about the character. That's the right word. I need yes. to care about the character. I need character. to care also. Mm-hmm don't need to like them like them but there are shows that a lot of people love where the characters are interesting but i really despise them like i have uh-huh. they have no vulnerability like i have no empathy for them i don't i just dislike them i can't yeah. like a show like that mm-hmm. that's fair i realize I, my thing is i need to respect the character i don't need to like them but mm. i need to respect them mm-hmm. oh uh, i like that i think season yep. three made me realize that a little bit because i'm sure we'll get to this later but by the end of season three i don't really respect eleanor I think a lot of viewers don't, and there's a lot of a lot of people really yeah. hate Eleanor by the end of season three. A lot of people think the people who hate Eleanor are being unfair to Eleanor. Um, there's a lot of interesting, differing opinions. Um, there are. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is yes. interesting. Eleanor, Eleanor is a fa- she's a fascinating. <laughs> we've we've talked about her every season. She is a we fascinating have. topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my thing is, right. I'm like, oh, I no longer respect her because she's not doing intelligent things, and I don't respect I don't respect. Um, on intelligence and it doesn't need to be book smart you know because i right. love charles vane and he's his intelligence is not book smart right um but right yeah, 
he's not she's not making smart moves and therefore i don't mm-hmm. respect her mm-hmm. yeah. and right, yeah. that's we, totally we, divorced we... from the question of whether you like her mm-hmm. right of course yes we'll we'll uh I, she's yeah, she's not officially on the list, but I, I knew we'd get to her. <laughs> right, <laughs> well, for sure. All right. So before we start with uh, with topics, um, I wanted to just have us like talk about some of our favorite things from this season. This season is so full of favorite things that mm-hmm. I don't even know how I'm going to sure answer is. some of these things. <sighs> this is it's going to be hard because there's so many. But let's start with the hardest one. What's your favorite Jack Rackham line? Uh, <laughs> this is actually not hard for me. Please understand. I'm quite particular about my library. Okay. That's <laughs> yours. Um, thank you, Celeste. I have no notes. I knew you were going to say that, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You all took my two of my favorites damn it mm. <laughs> why why am i the person asking the questions that's, that's right yeah that, that, was, that was a really there are bad so many good ones on though. i almost went with one day the whole damn belangerie which was wonderful too oh yeah that's also fabulous mm-hmm. uh i think i might have to go with to be underestimated is a great gift no that's just wrong i mean i love that oh what am i going to say uh yes you all took really good ones <laughs> why have uh, i done this to myself <laughs> well there's also the um you and not, i were neck and neck up until the end but uh yeah. but jesus did i make up a lot of ground oh, to catch you i love also that good one. all right that thank you lauren one. i'll take that one yeah. <laughs> although to be honest it's possibly what he just says always that might be my favorite line mm-hmm. i know it's not like it's not you know that kind of like very wonderfully arrogant jack thing right, classic but it jack just in that way just gets me to my core when he says that mm-hmm. that might be it oh i don't know okay well you know also, i'm on the re- Paul something or other when he shoots that guy and then goes did you know him Paul something or other yeah uh it's also <laughs> good and then uh, there's the i'll be your daddy that's also fantastic oh, I- <laughs> yes so many good ones how do you even I know. choose I know. I'm just going to fall back on what Liz said. I think it's Liz said that I pretty much just say that whatever Jack is doing in each episode is when I say, that's my favorite Jack moment. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm absolved. I'm absolved of this one. Okay. Favorite vein moment. Mm. Ooh, uh, come on. The leap off the horse. The leap off the horse. That's a good one. <laughs> this game exists for me because I've tried, I, in my own mind, I've predicted what you, each of you is going to say. <laughs> so, uh, so, so far, I, leap off the horse gift. Yeah, you know, gift. I know. No, no. I, so far, I'm batting 100. Okay, Liz, what's your favorite vein moment? My favorite. Oh, this is hard. But I'm going to have to say it's that little shake of the head he gives to Billy. <gasps> the tiny, Ooh. imperceptible mm. shake of the head. Damn, That's my that favorite a, vein moment. That is a good one too. For me, I think it's when he when he comes in on the duel. When he oh. when he comes in and oh, saves one. Yeah. That was a great moment too. Yeah. I think that's my favorite one because that is a tur- you know, such a turning point for him. And it is. It's, it's not like it's well, it's not less badass than the two things you t- both said, because, you know, pretty much everything he does is badass. But naturally. But- mm-hmm. But I think the symbolic nature of it, in addition to the vainness of it, is what gets me there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Favorite silver moment. Mm. <laughs> uh, this is so hard. <laughs> Favorite silver moment. I, I'm going to go with the confession about the gold in the third episode in the rowboat. Because I, I, that was just so unexpected. I never thought he would actually come yeah. clean to Flint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So give me some time here. I know it's hard. It's hard. I mean, especially with Silver because he goes through such an insane arc through this, well, this whole show, but through this season. Because like beginning beginning of season three, Silver and end of season three, Silver are such dramatically different things. And both of them so dramatically different than season one, Silver or season two, Silver. All right, I'll go, Liz. You have another minute. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's funny because the thing I love about Silver is actually his vulnerability, his moments of vulnerability. Uh, uh-huh. But my favorite Silver moment is right after the stomping is when he calms himself oh, down. Oh, yeah. 
that that is actually I mean, I'm just that's like up there with my favorite things of the whole season just because it's so it's so haunting and so amazing. Yeah. I'm going to have to go with the explanation of why he knows that Dobbs will do what he asked of him. Oh, yes. That was just such great. Gosh, that was great stuff. It was great work. It was great character work. And that understanding of this, like the myth he was building about himself, not knowing at the same time that Billy was building a myth about him. It was just really gorgeous. That was a great moment. Yeah, that was. All right. Favorite ship moment. This one's for Liz. <gasps> Uh, favorite ship moment had to be that, what did we call it? A, a, w- You're picking When they mine. turn the ship, well, because it was the best <laughs> moment. I mean, we're watching the same show. <laughs> that was incredible. Yes. Um, and you, we, you called it something in particular too. It was a specific right. kind of. A med mooring. Maneuver. Oh. Yes. Oh, that was amazing. That was just so intense and fun to watch and just thrilling. All right, Lauren, what's your favorite ship moment? This might be kind of a cop-out answer, but just at the end of the duel episode, just seeing Vane and Flint on the bow of a ship together. That's the first, the first and only time in the whole show that we see that. It's only uh-huh. the second time we see Vane on the bow of a ship. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, just Vane and Flint are one of my favorite character pairings in all of television. And just to see yep. them have a quiet, contemplative moment together. Yes. So on a ship. Is Absolutely. Just, yeah, everything I love about the show. All right, That's we awesome. all we I think we all have to give like special mention to the fire ship though. Fire ship is cool. Yep. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, favorite Anne Bonny moment. It's got to be her swinging off the side of the rigging with her hair down and just looking completely badass and awesome, right? Yeah, and seeing her scream fire for the first time. Yep. Oh yep. yeah, that- and the and that mermaid dive thing i was pretty clear on how much i love all that that's not actually mine mine is in the cave when she kisses max on the head and says i trust you oh yeah heartbreaking stuff i do love though i think my favorite kiss on the show is when she kisses jack in the wreckage of the carriage and he says yes (laughs) yeah that's adorable that was adorable that was super darling yeah yeah (laughs) see i Reminded me a little bit of the Princess Bride, actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, that's so true. Wait, did you say that during the episode? And I, I don't not think remember. I did. That's I've so mentioned true. Princess Bride several times right. during this podcast, but I don't think I mentioned it then. But yes, gently. No, yeah, no, that's totally. That's... <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was what first got me into pirate stories, the Dread Princess Bride and the Dread Pirate Roberts. I was like, right? right? I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I love that. Right. And very relevant. Very relevant. Uh-huh. About and actually, the name. Um, fun little tidbit. Um, in, I think in my uh, episode write-up for the finale, I mentioned that um, when Anne Bonny wears her hair in a half updo as she swim boards the ship, she kind of looks mm-hmm. like Vane from behind. And I wasn't sure if that was on oh. purpose or just a coincidence. Oh. Um, uh-huh. And Toby Schmitz mentioned that it was on purpose and that was yeah. uh, Flurry Patchett's idea. Oh, oh, I wow. love that. How could that not be? I mean, that's a great idea. And yeah, yeah. that, yeah, that's definitely uh, go love would it. go on. I hadn't noticed it. I love that you noticed it. Mm-hmm. That definitely seems like the kind of thing that would end up being intentional. And that's gorgeous. That's so yeah. true. Oh, I love that. Huh. Okay. Gonna have to hold on to that for a bit. Because uh, <laughs> that relates to something I want to say later on. Wow. Love that. Oh, I did, did I do a Flint? We didn't do a Flint moment. We didn't do a Flint moment. All right. What's your favorite Flint moment? <sighs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Give me so give me some hard. Time to think. Right. Think about think about the whole season. It's so easy to like for us because we just did the the last uh, the later episodes. It's easier to think more about those. But I'm gonna go with his speech in the fifth episode. Um, his really dramatic speech to the Maroon Queen, the Bring It All Down mm-hmm. speech. Uh, Not just because it's an excellent speech, but also because at that point in the season, he was kind of suicidal. Like he, you know. Right. Yeah. um, No, he was he was downright suicidal. Yeah. And usually when a television show makes its antihero like, quote unquote, go dark, their character development is kind of stagnant and they just kind of stay dark the rest of the way. 
And I remember that impressed me so much because even though Flint had gone dark and I had I had actually kind of thought that Silver would supersede Flint from now on in the show at that point. But then Flint turned around and made that speech and I was like, oh my God, Black Sails, like Flint is still developing and still interesting even though he's yeah. gone dark, which mm-hmm. most... Which, like, is very rare on television when your anti-hero goes dark. Yeah. Oh, I like that's that. That's true. I like that, too. That is totally true. So, like, like that. even three seasons in, even though I know how good the show is at character development and how good Flint is, that still was, like, a shocking reminder for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's just, it's just such a beautiful moment. I mean, I, yes. I think I said back then, and I still, every single time I watch it, I'm just like, sign me up. I want yep. in. Like uh-huh. it's just, yep. it's just I'm on like, board. right. Well, it's just, it's just amazing. I mean, it's, it's amazing how he, you know, went down this kind of crazy road and was suicidal, and then somehow managed to not only like bounce back, but, but broaden the story he was telling so much to encompass all oppressed people. Mm. He went from like, I'm angry they did crappy things to me to like, let me broaden this and and make this about all oppression, which I felt like was, uh-huh. you know, that was like, yeah, that was like the what he thought he was doing all along. Mm-hmm. He thought he was, you know, he was being the righteous person going down a righteous path. And I feel like that was the moment where he actually, whether he'll keep it or not, um, that was You're the right. moment where <laughs> that was the moment where he actually um fulfilled the vision that he had Mm -hmm. for himself all along and yet it's still an absolutely insane speech like you're like so many variables have to fall in this place to work and the fact that everyone agrees to go along with it and as the viewer you're like yeah flint sign me up for your plan right exactly (laughs) (laughs) sign me up for your crazy suicide mission (laughs) exactly it just goes to show how much charisma he still has and how much power he still has when he wants to like, he can right. get everyone to sign on for this absolutely insane, never going to work mission. Right. And you totally buy it. Like, oh, absolutely. You yeah. totally, totally buy it. And I, I'll never quite understand the magic that creates that. You know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, some amazing combination of the writing and his acting. But I just think in the hands of other writers and a different actor, he would just seem crazy. I mean, he, there's definitely always an edge of crazy in everything he does. Sure. Yeah. But when he manages to move people to Mm -hmm. do things that they wouldn't do, like, you know, sail into a storm or decide to be in open rebellion against (laughs) against England. Yes. You totally buy it. You totally like, yep, that that I totally see this happening. Like he gives Uh. these speeches and people follow him. Mm -hmm. Because the plot of Black Sails would not work if we did not buy that the men would follow him. Right. Yes, absolutely that is so true. not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole thing hinges on that. I mean, from the first episode, the fact that he manages to turn Billy around in the very first yeah. episode from Billy pointing a gun at him to mm-hmm. Billy hiding that blank piece of paper. Yeah. But I do, I think you're right that it's a combination of the writing and the performance. I mean, those two things have to mm-hmm. be equally strong because I can't... You're absolutely right. In the hands of another actor, he could just seem... Like he's got a screw loose. He could just seem <laughs> crazy and you Again. would wonder why people would follow him. And of course, yeah, he is a little crazy, obviously. Right. No, but that makes it all the stronger is that he, mm-hmm. you, you're totally aware at the same moment that he's a little, you know, damaged, crazy, whatever you want to call right. it. Yeah, because we know more than everybody else does. Uh huh. And Right. We definitely do because we get to mm-hmm. see Flint when he hides from everyone else. When he hides his vulnerability, we are the only ones who get to see it. Right. And at the same time... Yeah, we totally buy it. Like, yeah. dude's crazy, and mm-hmm. he's, like, the most powerful person in the room at all times, exactly. bordering on deityhood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> at least uh-huh. in some people's eyes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. That's neat stuff. I think for me that my favorite Flint moment actually in this season has to be him in the dream sequences with death. And Miranda, wow. they wow. were just so subtle and beautiful and moving. And it was such a different kind of light that we had on Toby Stevens's face even. Mm-hmm. And he had, I don't even know how to put it, but you saw more, I don't know, you saw his freckles and you saw his, 
I guess, humanity more. He mm-hmm. just seems so vulnerable, I guess, is the word, and just tired. And I don't know. It was lovely. I loved those sequences. Yeah. And the white shirt. Yeah, and a white shirt, and he's wearing a white mm-hmm. shirt. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So my favorite, I think, God, it's really hard. I know I, I had the idea to do this crazy thing with the favorites. <laughs> I think, I think my favorite Flint is when he's sitting down across from Woods Rogers. That's a good one. I know. I feel like that is the perfect. I mean, when he's sitting with with Silver at the end, also is a similar kind right. of thing. But I feel like w- with Woods Rogers, it's the perfect combination of like badass flint and like uh-huh. totally broken up flint and hiding it which oh, i oh yeah um so it just in the subtlety i mean it's it's for mm-hmm. me it, it it's similar to um uh, in season two when he's at the dinner table with peter with miranda and peter yes. ash like that same yes. kind of thing where it's like every everything you're learning about what's going on in flint's face in flint's mind is from these most minute things going on in his face mm-hmm. and he's being vulnerable and strategic at the same time and that's kind yeah. of that's that's kind of my happy place for flint uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> season three also, <laughs> yeah, also solidified that this show has the highest concentration of actors on tv who can smile without actually smiling <laughs> <laughs> for sure we always knew he could do it and we always knew Zach could do it but I feel like I didn't know that Luke could do it too oh, until God. the finale right. of season 3 oh, and so, like, goodness three, right. I, I feel like Toby Schmitz probably does it too although yeah like yeah, yeah Toby Schmitz sinister... does so much with his face that it's you yeah. know it's hard to parse exactly what all of the genius is and the things he does with his face I was gonna say I, and uh, up till now Jack hasn't really looked like s- as sinister as the others have had to look maybe right. in season four um, maybe but yeah just that that smile without actually smiling I'm like how do you yeah. do that mm-hmm. <laughs> yes so yeah you're right totally true and it is true when uh yes <laughs> The season finale when Fl- and Flint actually does a bigger smile than usual right at the end of of the season finale, and with it being larger, it is actually a million times more terrifying. <laughs> and then and then yeah, when 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 Silver does it too, yeah, shivers. It just scared the <laughs> shit out of me. <laughs> that that whole fireside thing scares me. I know Luke Luke made it sound less sinister, all of it less sinister than. <laughs> how I've always looked at it I'm I'm integrating his what he said and I think it's brilliant it still oh, terrifies me yeah, yeah that was very interesting uh I think I fall kind of between him and you or I don't think it was necessarily as much of a threat as your mm-hmm. take but I don't think it was as much of a non-threat as he seemed to think uh, right like there was a, right. an element of threat in it but maybe it was a little subconscious and silver wasn't like overtly trying to be threatening mm, right interesting. oh I don't yeah. think he was overtly trying to be threatening I think that I I do believe that his part of the conversation perhaps was more orchestrated than Luke's take on it. Because it's hard for you to imagine Silver, like, again, it's, I mean, Maddie opened a lot of doors for him. Like, we, we talked mm-hmm. a lot about opening doors. So I feel like Maddie did help Silver in a lot of ways find a place of actually, you know, human to human connection that he had either suppressed or hadn't learned how to do yet or... Or something like that. So I feel like he was using some of those newly found skills with Flint that night. But it's still hard for me to imagine Silver. There's the one moment, the moment where he says, where he says that it won't be you. It'll, I mean, it won't be me. It'll be you. And then he immediately launches into talking about Dobbs. Like that he's, mm-hmm. he's like, it won't, it won't be me. It'll be you. And let me show you how like badass, yeah. like how incredibly powerful I've become. So that's mm-hmm. the moment where, for me, it really feels like it was an orchestrated conversation from his side. Mm-hmm. See, my take was actually that it was less orchestrated, but that still made it very threatening in that, because he had really no way of knowing the whole story with Thomas, so he couldn't possibly have orchestrated anything um, right. around that. Um, but the So basically, my interpretation was that it kind of sh- showed us how spry he is on his feet. Yeah. Like the fact that it wasn't orchestrated, but he was able to just ad- adapt immediately to what was happening right. and add in his own kind of crazy concoction to the situation. Um, <laughs> just showed how intelligent and fast, quick-witted he is. 
Yeah, mm. which yeah, which we do know about him. That is that's that's the that's right? the thread that he's had throughout. That's totally mm-hmm. true. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I don't I don't think it has like a definitive reading. <laughs> no, it's true. No, it's, I mean, I don't think it's that's, supposed to. Yeah, right. That's the beautiful thing about that scene is I feel like I can watch it many times and come out of it each time with a slightly different take on it just myself and and that you know right the three of us each see it slightly differently luke sees it slightly differently you know we will be forced to ask john steinberg how he sees it <laughs> i feel like that's a conversation that's that's a scene or whatever a scene broken into parts that you know you really can't talk about too much mm. um just and and it's so pivotal i mean that don't want to get into predictions yet because that's our game later but i feel uh-huh. like you know it's pretty obviously the span of that conversation like all the other stuff is amazing and important for the plot and what and the story continuing but mm-hmm. really that conversation is what is launching season four i think yeah no as soon as i saw that scene i was like oh next season is going to be the final season okay hmm right well, that and and you and I have talked about the fact that you know Vane's death makes much more sense. Right. Once well, I was going to know... say, yeah, I was initially very concerned about their decision to kill Vane and then possibly have like two to three more seasons. I was like, that is way too soon for a character right. who leaves this kind of footprint on the show. Like, uh-huh. yeah, you're gonna the show's not going to be as good. Like it's, but I think it will be as good because you know season four is going to be a season long climax. So I don't think we yes. need to worry about uh, the Vane absence. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, sad, saddened by the vain absence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but- well, no, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I guess because, yeah, I mean, t- to me, um, a season without Charles Vane is kind of like uh, Liz to you, a season without tall ships. <laughs> oh, uh-huh. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Ooh. Wow, that's heartbreaking. I'm sorry, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Like the moment, like Vane interferes in the duel, th- that, yeah. that 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 was kind of an echo of what he did in Charleston, but it still managed to be new and not repetitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel like the moment when Vane uh, kind of interferes like that and moves the plot is always like one of the best parts of every season because it like mm-hmm. totally moves the plot, but doesn't feel like the writers moving the plot because it's totally organic to Vane's character, and there isn't really another character like that, and, Yet. and or anyone else who has. Uh, his unique kind of intelligence that he's mm-hmm. it's not a talky kind of intelligence like everyone else's mm-hmm. um, yeah he i mean he's ve- definitely an irreplaceable character um, right yeah but i think i'm i'm excited to see how season four will handle that yeah uh okay i will bite my tongue because that's then we're going <gasps> to pre- then we're going into prediction mode which i'm not <laughs> oh, gonna do yet uh, sure sure <laughs> I was concerned by episode nine. Episode ten made me trust the show that they knew what he was doing, what they were doing by killing him. Mm-hmm. However, Eleanor's arc made me a little bit nervous about that. But I think she is one character where I'm just going to have to sit back and evaluate her arc once it's all complete. Right. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that goes into the first topic on my list. Is um, I guess I mean Liz and I have we've talked about this topic quite a bit. So I want Lauren to weigh in. Like, what do you think about our whole theory about uh, heavy crowns and that, and that mm. Eleanor was ma- being, she was being really smart for a while in this season up until the end. And that we, we have this theory that, um, that when that she was never good at wearing the crown, right? So we have Maddie who introduced this concept of the crown when she's talking mm-hmm. to Silver and says that the crown is heavy and that you weren't you weren't prepared for this and I was, right? So that's a really interesting dynamic. Uh, Eleanor also was not prepared for it. And now we have, mm-hmm. in season three, we have this new version of the story or this new insight that Scott kind of pushed her forward specifically for his own needs. Oh, right. you know, right. That Scott was like, well, I kind of encouraged her to take over because I needed to do this double role of these mm-hmm. two, these two communities. So we have had this theory that we kind of built over the season that like Eleanor was really being super smart, like our her best Eleanor for most of this season because she was in a subordinate role. She suddenly didn't wasn't wearing the crown and that that suddenly when Woods Rogers was taken out of the picture, that she was in charge again and then she just started making really bad choices. 
So th- how how do you feel about that? I mean, I want to talk about the the concept of the crown in relation to a lot of characters, but this was yeah. this is kind of where we went with the Eleanor story. Like that was that was an explanation that worked for me because because it was such a theme of this season of like heavy crowns, people wearing the crown and doing poorly and then being taking the crown off and then doing much better. Although some people like the Queen and Maddie seem to wear that crown just fine. Mm hmm. <laughs> I was going to say, I've struggled a lot with Eleanor's season three character arc, um, and I, I don't think I'm alone, um, but, uh, yeah, hmm, okay, I guess to begin with, <laughs> 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 um, I guess a- entering the season, it, season three was the season where I was the most like, wow, I'm actually very intrigued to see about Eleanor's storyline this season, because mm-hmm. um, she was entering it in such an interesting place, just, you know, in jail, totally stripped of all her power. Right. Um, uh, I personally was not a fan of her relationships with Woods Rogers um, because I felt that after, well, first of all, I kind of felt like the tenderness of their sex scene, which you guys discussed, was mm-hmm. kind of unearned because they hadn't, yes, we'd seen them plan things together and plot, but we they didn't really go through anything major together the way Silver and Maddie are going through something major, or the way. Uh huh. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of felt like there wasn't enough to earn it. And then after their sex, when she says, um, "I don't want to be that person anymore," I'm paraphrasing what she said. Right. Um, no, that's that's pretty much what she said. Uh, yeah. To me, that is kind of a little bit dramatically inert to have a character just say, "I want to change," rather than see them go through a change. Mm-hmm. Um, and like okay. I totally understand why narratively the show didn't want to spend a lot of time grappling with her mindset when she was in jail, like you know because that's not really the main story. So mm-hmm. I, I guess that we couldn't really have seen her have this internal shift. But as a result, like at least for me as the audience, we are not privy to her internal shift besides her just say- saying I have had an internal shift. Right. So that yeah, a, that makes sense. That was a big yeah. Eleanor's that was a big just like the show is usually so so good at show don't tell and but her whole love with woods rogers to me is not that it's telling and not showing so Uh. i've I've been very and then you know her whole decision to hang vain then uh to me was kind of throwing out the window um her character development in terms of you know not caring what the street would think i was like that's totally not eleanor Um, right so yeah i that was one problem i had with vain's death like i no longer because I actually that was my first uh, negative review. I felt like totally guilty. I did write a negative review of that episode. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I was my coworkers were laughing at me because I was kind of agonizing over it, and I was like, "But I can't lie." <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, um, yeah. And no, so, it's important. Um, the portion of the negative review that pertains to I'm concerned it was too soon to kill Vane no longer stands, obviously, since I did not know at the time that season four was the final season. Right. Um, however, uh-huh. the portion of the review that said, this concerns me because, like, you need to know what you're doing if you're removing a character like that, um, you know, who's that um, important to the plot. And right. its effect on Eleanor's character arc made me concerned that they did not know what they were doing because it did not affect her plot in a compelling way, in my opinion. Um but, you know, yeah, like I said, I'm going to have to see how her story plays out in season four. I think I'm going to have to evaluate when I see how it shakes out. Yeah. Sorry, that didn't really... I'm no, sorry, no, that that's didn't fine. Really the crown question. No, um, no. Well, I, I do still want to talk about crowns. I mean, that she's just one aspect of that question. Um, I just, I'm really, uh, yeah, I got a little fixated on this whole crown thing just because I think because I'm mostly... Because I'm mostly fascinated with with now Maddie and Flint as the kind of two people flanking Silver, yes. um, and the the you know the comparing and the contrasting of them. I mean, the Queen definitely also part of this, but I feel like again, I don't I don't know what place the Queen's going to play in season four, but I feel like you know there was you know in in the last episode of uh, of season three there was obviously a shift from the Queen being the the person in charge to Maddie. So yeah, I just, I, I'm fascinated by this because I feel like this really, this really ended up being something that touched a lot of the characters. Like we had Jack, we talked about Jack, like Jack was doing so poorly when mm-hmm. he was actually in charge. And then he really um, pulled his shit together when he stopped 
being concerned about being in charge. I mean, he wasn't in charge at the end. He was also right. in a subordinate yeah. role in the end of the season. But when he just stopped worrying about being in charge, like suddenly mm-hmm. he he reached new levels of or, or new new truly new like <laughs> levels levels of of badass that he had never actually that we had never seen in him at all. Well, I think I think as we learned from season two with his uh, fight with Linus. <laughs> that uh jack jack wears his crown best when he's backed into a corner not when he's like Uh uh-huh not when he has he's like one of those writers who when you give him a whole month to write at a retreat they get nothing done (laughs) but then if they get like one weekend they'll produce a masterpiece novel like that is jack (laughs) i love that analogy that's great jack needs pressure in order for his crown to be worn well right well, I think, also, and I think part of that is that he, when he can't navel gaze, when he can't think about what he's doing, when he has to just act, he's actually quite good at it. Exactly, because then his ego do- can't get in his way. Exactly, exactly. So that's Jack's whole thing. The thing that's in, that's most interesting to me ultimately about this is is the you know the really beautiful parallel that happens near the end of the season with um, Maddie and her mother and Silver and Flint. And we don't know how the Silver and, well, we don't know how either of these things are going to play out, but Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, what, what we got from the season finale is that the queen is going, you know, seems to be understanding the, how the sands have shifted Mm -hmm. and, and seems to be uh, being, gracious and respectful about this shift that uh, that obviously is happening that should put power more in the hands of her daughter than in herself Mm. um and whereas flint uh pretty obviously i mean i think silver sees himself now as you know he made that comparison about you know looking into the eyes of your successor i think that silver sees that um and yeah flint doesn't i don't i don't i don't see flint letting go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but at the same time, like we also noticed that Flint was being near the end of the season when he started delegating, like the delegating to Silver and to Billy was hard for him. But it also mm-hmm. like he had, he had seen more balanced and at peace than he ever had before. That's interesting. So, you know what, maybe what could uh, redeem Eleanor's story for me is that if she has a similar arc where she and Rogers kind of have that same relationship um, or a similar relationship in that, like, you know, she's kind of the one orchestrating, even though he's supposedly the leader. Um, I wonder, Uh that would be very interesting if season four, uh, keep in mind, I really have no idea um, if they had him slowly becoming aware that the decisions she's making are not necessarily the best decisions. And if there's a, and if a clash arises there, that would be very interesting. That would be, I like that. Right. Except that butts up against another thing that often happens in this show is that people become intoxicated when they're in love and don't necessarily make good choices. Uh I mean, that's, that is something when there's any heightened emotion, Right. Regardless we of have, what that emotion is. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good true. point. So that's some that is something that we've seen consistently in this show. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and to, to go back to actually answer your question about Eleanor and the Crown, which I didn't really do before. <laughs> no, it's, <okay. laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, in my view, Eleanor wears the crown best um, when she ignores her emotions um, and acts not because of them, but in spite mm-hmm. of them. Because mm-hmm. uh, to me, the two instances in the show where I have actually genuinely respected Eleanor and found her very competent and interesting. Season two, when she steals Abigail Ash from under Vane's nose. And, yep. Yes. Um, yep. Because that, like, that was such, uh, I think I mentioned last time when I was on, that was one of my favorite Eleanor moments when they're looking mm-hmm. at each other through the bars. Yes, um, I agree. Because, no, because you genuinely feel for her because she is act like she clearly is upset at you know yes. screwing Vane over, but she is real she's acting she's ignoring her emotions and doing what she thinks is the smart move. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know it's not her fault that the stuff with Abigail did not work out. There are extraneous factors there, so it really was the smart move. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, I guess in season three, when she advised Rogers to meet Flint at the beach to you know uh, to ward off his recruitment efforts, mm-hmm. right. Because uh, she was kind of putting aside her any emotions she might have had from her uh, relationship with Flint, and that that is another thread that I do not know fully picked up in season four. 
but uh, I hope uh, her friendship with Flynn, like that was a really interesting part of the show. It I realized was. when I was really watching I did the like two that. seasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I do hope that's revisited in some way. Either just they have a scene together, or, you know, something to acknowledge their former friendship. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I think Eleanor wears the crown well when she ignores her emotions, which is not what she was doing in the latter half of season three, because that's very as true. we saw in, you yeah. know, her jail cell scene of fame, that was driven. her totally oh. flying off the handle and acting yeah. purely out of emotion. Yes. Yep. yes. Yes. That is not her best self. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I want to move on to another thing. I guess I guess I, I'm looking at my list, and I feel like there's a theme in my list of like people needing to walk away from things that <laughs> that they're that they're drawn to. <laughs> That's Uh-oh. the theme of my notes. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about backstories. We got a bunch of backstories in this. I mean, we got Flint's obviously in season right. two, so that was you know huge. We got some backstories in this. I guess in some way, Luke confirmed that we will have some variation on a backstory some for Silver, but sort of his answer was yes. kind of weird and kind of terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we will have something that resembles or refers to a backstory in a way we don't expect. I think that's right. what he had to say. Yeah, in an interesting way. Uh huh. Right. I just felt like there's an interesting dynamic with backstories here. So, okay, that's true. We actually got Vane's backstory in season one, mm-hmm. right? But um, I feel like we added to it. We added to it here in terms of his relationship with Blackbeard. And the fact yeah, that he that's was true. Spanish. No, no, you're totally right. No, you're right. We did. The Spanish is interesting, but I, it doesn't really fit with what I'm about to say. Like, So I feel like the thing with the backstories is, especially with Max and with Jack, like with Bane and like with Flint, when mm-hmm. you get their backstory, like a lot of things about their personality kind of clicks into place. Right. Like you're like, mm-hmm. okay. Now, now I get you. Like you had all the, you had these motivations I didn't quite understand, and now I have your backstory. So now, now all that makes sense to me. And I'll, I'll always go back to what Max, just me in that cave. It's just me in that cave all the time. Um, uh. What Max said in that cave. No, I, 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 yeah, that scene really moves me a lot. Um, but what mm-hmm. she, when she compared the choices she was about to make about why they needed to separate and why she was going to remain and stay and try to integrate herself into this, you know, mm-hmm. coming civilization. Uh, and she used the words beyond choice. So she compared it essentially to Anne's sexuality. Mm-hmm. I just find that a very compelling way to look at people's motivations and look at, you know, if you're looking at it in a more psychological way, like, you know, whatever childhood traumas they had and that they need yeah. to actualize work through in their adult selves but i feel like the interesting thing that came up near the end so we have okay so we have max we understand like we understand she was looking in that window she wanted to be in that parlor she wanted to be Mm -hmm. in that world right jack we understand the whole thing with his name because Mm -hmm. of because of his father becoming a debtor and dying and you know and that their name was ruined. So both of them, like, you're like, okay, I get it. Like, this is why you all are a bit fixated on the things that, right. you're, that you're fixated that, like, you know, in a way, Anne with both of them is like, come on, guys. Oh, right. We got right. Anne's backstory in season two as well. But, like, in season three, Anne with both of her people, she's just like, why are you all being like this? You're making bad choices, essentially. But we understand them once we get the backstory. Hmm. Um. And then the thing that I noticed in the end of season three is that Jack, again, under pressure, lets go of his thing. He lets go of this whole concept of his name. Like he just becomes part of the communal attempt to to uh, fight England, but not he doesn't really talk about how Jack Rackham's going to do this. He, he's like part of. In fact, he says, I'll be your Charles Vane. Like he even is like taking away, he's taking away his own identity in this. But I was going to say, saying I'll be your Charles Vane is kind of that same impulse towards a name and identity. It's just channeling it in a different direction. Right. But it's not about him. It's not about creating something for Jack Rackham to be famous for. It's saying, he's saying, I will be part of your, I will be part of this united front. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Whereas I think with the coalition in Nassau, yes, he was in coalition, but really his only focus was how Jack Rackham's name was going to become one of the names of, you know, of Nassau. Mm -hmm. And that was his motivation for going back to get the pardon. And that was his motivation when he was, you know, his choices that he made to to not collaborate and give them the cash. That was also about making a name for himself. All of these choices, like, you know, a lot of the shit that happened you could argue Vane dying even were yeah. partly because of Jack's obsession with his name. Mm -hmm. And um, he lets go of it. And then at the end, he's in kind of a good place. Like he's reconnected with Anne. He has Flint's respect. He even begrudgingly has Teach's respect. Mm -hmm. And then you contrast that with Max, who's still going down the road that is supposed to fulfill her childhood trauma, her backstory. Right. And she's so isolated and alone and miserable and has betrayed, you know, Jack and Anne and and is what she's trying to, like, be friends with Eleanor and Mapleton. Like, <laughs> right? it's just she's just not in a good place. So I feel mm -hmm. like there might be some overarching thing about it's funny, like I was always so gratified by getting people's backstories. But now at the end of season three, I feel like perhaps what we're supposed to be learning here is that you need to get beyond that. Like you need to actually grow oh. beyond where your backstory is informing all of your, mm -hmm. all of your behaviors and your choices. And that might be, that might be the lesson that we're supposed to learn. I feel like, yeah, we'll have to talk about that in relation to Vane. Like Vane's a special case. And I was going to say also, um, I feel like I'll be very curious to see if Jack kind of, forgetting it is a permanent situation in season four no it might not be or is just right. a for no thing. guarantee right or is like i said he kind of appropriates uh veins for his so like he's still fighting for mm -hmm. a name it's just you know and an identity but it's just veins instead of his i don't you know mm -hmm. no but i still think that if he was fighting for someone else's name that's all that's still him moving past this obsession with his own name i still see that as growth it's um, true although i i tend to think with 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 Lauren that he's not going to end up doing that that he's going to fall back oh, to Oh sure sure sure. I I mean yeah, I don't think I don't think it's a Jack linear Rackham. thing necessarily. And and the message of needing to to learn how to not be obsessed with the things from your childhood traumas does mm -hmm. not mean that that's a that that's a one-way track and you get there and you're done. Because that's I mean that's not how people work. We don't like mm -hmm. we don't we're not like okay I learned that I'm done I don't need to that's true yeah <laughs> I don't need to yeah. work on myself anymore I am I am complete. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> people don't work that way. <laughs> that's very fair. But that doesn't that doesn't negate the message that as much as your backstory can inform and explain your behaviors doesn't necessarily mean that those behaviors are the right road for you and i feel like mm. there seems to be a clear trend happening here flint also so like right we understand we understand flint's craziness once we learn about him and thomas right and yet the worst thing flint could do is just to be about vengeance and about you know and like going down this road of trying in his own mind mm. to avenge and at the same time fulfill thomas's dream i mean that, yeah. that that's that's not gone very well for flint he needed to you know then that ended up in even more tragedy and he needed to kind of let go of that like and become mm -hmm. this other person to start being act you know being productive i don't know i'm not productive is not the right word but to be controlling his his choices again which i feel like he does do in season three mm -hmm. i feel like in, in seasons one and two he's just He's just barreling down this road that was created by by his tragedy. Mm -hmm. And in season three, again, I don't know if it's a good road for him, but at least it's a different one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so do yeah, really I, hope season what? four has a callback to uh, the mistook his oar for a shovel. Oh, oh me too. That's too, like my yeah. one wish with Flint's right. story for season four. Like anything else could happen. He could die, whatever. But if before he dies, uh, there's some kind of callback to that, oh, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's also, nice. there's also, I was thinking back to stuff from this season. You know, when he's doing the speech to the queen, he talks about people taking their shovels and turning them into swords. Oh, uh huh. So there, so that is, I mean, it's not a callback, but that's like a, I don't know, a, 
reimagining of that perhaps like that's like that's a a version of that that's more taking the ore and turning into a shovel is you know suits what flint's dream was in the beginning and then his new dream is to take shovels and turn them into swords Hmm. it would be very satisfying to go back to ore to shovel i don't know if we get to have that kind of satisfaction with Flint. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just not sure that's the road they're taking us down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but speaking of Vex stories, because one of the things I am most curious about for season four is how Anne's story will resolve. Because mm-hmm. um, if you don't know the history, Anne Bonny historically like disappeared in history, so they have full free reign to oh. end her story however they want. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Happily. Yeah, totally I would like it with champagne and flowers. That's how I would like uh, the story. Sure. Uh-huh. <laughs> Don't no, hold your breath uh, for that one. <laughs> <laughs> are, are we considering history to be a spoiler alert or are we okay with... No, no. Go no, ahead. No, no, yeah. Go for it. Go for it. It's, it, was, it was 300 years ago. I, right? say, yeah. I, th- I think you guys have already said this. Like Jack will most likely die. It's very unlikely right, that yeah. he won't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it'll be very interesting to see... If Anne dies by his side, together till the fucking ground, mm-hmm. so they could have, you know, paved the right. road for that with that line. Right. Or if, you know, tethering herself to Jack is, fits into her backstory, and so if she separates from him and lives, because um, historically the real Anne Bonny, her last words to Jack were very, very cold, um, and oh. she did not die with him. So they could, you know, to go that backstory route, you know, have her not go- So that'll be very, very interesting to see what happens. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm officially putting that into the end where we do our predictions because I want uh-huh. each of us to predict. Sorry, I was jump, jumping in the gun on that. No, 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 because no, you, you didn't though. predict. You gave options, so we yeah. can make that officially part of our prediction game. I was going to say because the show has pretty much like paved the way for either of those routes to feel earned and organic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's let's talk about Bane. I know that's a big okay. topic. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about Vane's arc. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like Vane's arc is huge in the whole three seasons. Uh Uh-huh, for sure. On some levels, it seems smaller here because he already was in coalition with Flint. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about when he's in Ocracoke, when when Flint comes to get him in Ocracoke. This is what I want to talk about. Like, because, okay, so we have like, you know, Vane being part of the coalition. It seems like, you know, new Vane, right? And then Teach Mm -hmm. shows up and lures him out of that because that coalition was not turning out to be exactly the life that Vane wanted and right. or, you know, his responsibility, his his sense of his responsibilities to teach supersedes uh, his other responsibilities. Right. So the thing that that I'm still very fixated on is what Flint said to Vane right before the duel, which is he said to Vane, basically, I don't care what what you said to me, I don't care what you said to teach. Who are you? Hmm. This is this is the thing. And right. I feel I mean, I said it back then, I still believe very strongly, this is the moment that Vane, this was a shift for Vane, that mm-hmm. he could have he could have stood with Flint at any point in that whole episode. But it's after Flint said, Who are you? And mm-hmm. essentially absolved him of his former sense of what his honor is about because he's always been about honor and truth and all of that and i feel like flint opened the door for him to become the vein who sacrifices himself for the greater good Hmm. i think he kind of always was that guy to some extent um the way i've kind of always looked at him is charles vane always does the wrong thing when it's the right thing to do um so Mm -hmm. like stabbing blackbeard in the back was the oh, wrong thing, I see. Yeah. but it was the right thing to do. Um, rescuing Flint from Charleston. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the wrong thing to blow up a whole town, but that uh, was yeah. the right thing to do. Yeah, so that's kind of who he's always been. And so framed in that light, I feel like he always was the guy who would have sacrificed himself. Yeah, perhaps he was always the guy who would sacrifice himself. I don't think he was the guy who would have left Teach. I think that gave him the room that gave him the freedom to actually for the first time in his life, like truly choose. I think he always was weighted down. He was always weighed down, even though he seemed like the freest person. I think he was still always weighed down by 
external views of who he was. Like yes. he, he lived with the burden of judgment on him that he wasn't book smart, that he was that mm -hmm. that he that he grew up an enslaved person, that I think that that was the moment where he where Flint freed him. I do think that Flint actually freed him from a sense of external choice, like or, or externally motivated choices about what was the right thing to do. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say because he did, he did feel conflict about it even right away when he went off with Teach because we saw when they sure, sure. were on the Absolutely. Spanish right. ship, um, right? Yeah, I, I think it like so he always felt conflicted about it, and Flint kind of handed him the tools to do it permanently. But I think he would have done it on his own, uh, just not as Flint just exacerbated that process. Right. Yeah, but I mean that's I do think that flint became a motivator for other characters i mean this is part of a larger thing like i actually it's interesting that you said i mean it is and it's totally true what you said about flint that he was suicidal and went dark and then and then still grow grows i've started to believe that the that see that seasons one and two are about flint and that season three is actually about silver like I think that there was a shift yeah. between seasons two yeah. and seasons no, three about that. about who I mean, of course, this is an ensemble cast. It's about all of them. That the primary person becomes became Silver in season three, and it's interesting. I love what Luke said, like that he was joking. He was well, he was joking, but it was true that that Silver in the beginning was basically a plot point. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not saying that Flint is a plot point. I mean, we have very intimate internal moments with him. The dreams, obviously, right. the like breaking down in his cabin, you know. All of those are more in the earlier part of the season, though. Like, there mm -hmm. is a kind of, I feel like there is a handing off from Flint to Silver. And then I think, I'm not going to say that Flint becomes a plot point, but I feel like Flint becomes perhaps more of a, not, and not a device. That's not the word I'm looking for. I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for because I'm less good at story He's terms. Certainly an <laughs> obstacle, although I right? don't know if that's what you're looking no, for. No, I'm not sure. I don't think. I, I, well, yes. I mean, I Flint. I think Flint will always be an obstacle because yeah, because he is such a strong force. Yes, but I think there's an element where like it becomes less about his own growth and change and more about how he influences other characters. Mm. Like once we're Island, done eventually he's kind of this ghost who's this force exactly right. exactly exactly so i feel like there's this you know i mean the doldrums episode obviously like flint i mean we again right we see very very intimate and moving internal stuff with him because we're still having the dream sequences and we that is where we see him break down after he shoots those two guys yes but i feel like there is a shift and i think it's a really interesting thing to look at how Flint ends up motivating other characters to go down the roads that they do. And mm -hmm. I really think that there is something there. Like we see the other characters really blossoming and there are other influences. I mean, for Silver, I think it's a mixture of his interactions with Flint and e possibly much more even his interaction with Maddie. I mean, I think Maddie really opened a whole world to Silver that, he hadn't even imagined like yeah. having community in the crew I had already done that for him like right. that he that opened a world for him that he hadn't imagined and he went through that door and then you know lost a leg but but, <laughs> but that Maddie then again for Silver just kind of opened up whole realms dimensions of how to be and interact and lead that uh -huh. were outside of his understanding but I also think that Flint does this. I mean, I think we see Billy really step up and start being a storyteller. We, we do. see we see Vane allow himself to not do the most honorable thing. Um, I I don't know. And then yes, do the most honorable thing. But you know what I mean. But I think yeah. that that moment where Vane leaves Teach is just such a huge moment for him that goes against really what he has always done also because Liz brought up like because a father figure because yeah. he just didn't have that or you know it'll be interesting to see in season four if Flint somehow influences teach to act against how he would normally act oh wow oh, that would that be would interesting. well yeah that would that would be like I don't know that would be like the world imploding <laughs> 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 or if Flint has any effect on Jack because they didn't really have m any scenes together they don't the have a lot of interaction finale. that's very true exactly oh that would be yeah that would be really cool I hope that we I mean who knows we we have no idea how this is all going to play know, out I know 
Yeah. But I'm yeah, but like I feel like it's a safe assumption to say that they'll probably interact more in season four than they have ever in the past by necessity. Yeah. By necessity, yeah, I think you're absolutely yeah. right. Yep. But it'll did. be very interesting to see if he has any effect on Jack or if Jack's personality is so forceful that he's one of the only ones who's immune. Right. Which yes. would be great. That would be a fun thing to see is that innate immunity to Flint because we really haven't seen that. Sil- Silver has it to some extent, but we've seen him be won over and become a friend. Right. And I wonder... Well, and and to, you know, have crazy ideas and kind of worship Flint as well. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. Silver, Silver not so immune to Flint. <laughs> <laughs> he Wait, thinks he likes to think he is. He likes definitely to think likes he is. To, well, and it's and and again, well, he does I protect think... himself. I think a little bit from the influence of Flint. So yes. I mean, even when he fell under it, you know, in my defense, I hadn't had anything to eat or drink for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, but he follows that immediately with. But but what I was saying is kind of true. <laughs> that, that well, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, no, but I think, again, he has Maddie now. He has a tether. I mean, that's, you mm-hmm. know, that's, that's the whole thing. I love thing, that whole is idea that of the tether. That was just the, such great writing. The whole idea of the tether is incredible. Mm-hmm. And right. I mean, that's, that that's very explicitly said that, that, yeah. that he needs, that Silver needs a tether to survive, you know, going down into the darkness of Flint. Yeah. Yep. We don't know how much he's going to use that tether because then he found out that the darkness feels good. So we don't yeah, we don't know how that's going to play out. I but know. the tether has oh, been I'm offered. So to see, yeah. And you know, oh. and I do, I do feel like to some extent, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, that's gonna that has to end up being an interesting thing going back and forth because the last thing we see is Silver with Maddie. I mean, the whole, yeah. The yep. whole of the season finale seems to me a bit of a realignment of Silver towards Maddie and possibly yes. away from Flint. Um, yeah, well, it seems, to, it seems to be posing the question: which force will end up shaping Silver more? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, and Silver's a strong character, but he, for better and for worse, he's a very malleable character. So, like, this is the thing I wanted to bring up mm. was. Uh, Liz and I had talked a lot about uh, Flint as a malleable character, right? Like he kind of adopted uh, an identity when he met Thomas and Miranda, right? And and he uses that in a, in a lot of ways that are very beneficial to him. That he's very that he is often very quick to integrate other people's ideas into the way that he motivates, like into immediately mm-hmm. into his speeches and the way that he motivates other people. Silver seems to have this skill even more than Flint. Silver, you know, just just based on how much change we've seen him go through in the span of this story as we know it is mm-hmm. proof that Silver is so quick to integrate new concepts, new information into his being. Again, mm-hmm. for better and for worse. I mean, I think right. sometimes it happens faster than he knows how to deal with it. And yes. so sometimes his new newly integrated self is is surprising to him and sometimes dangerous to him Mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways this can go right so like there's there's the maddie influence and the flint influence silver seems uniquely uh uniquely nimble in this way like that he could it seems like one one way this could go is that he takes he integrates what he's learned from Flint and what he learned has learned from Maddie into something totally new that we aren't even necessarily imagining yet. Oh, Um, uh or that he will choose one. That's also an option. Mm -hmm. But part of me feels like what we saw happen in season three was Flint, who had always been our super malleable again, for better and for worse. Sometimes it works out well for Mm -hmm. him. Sometimes not. He's had moments where he gets stunted because he gets, you know, gets caught up in his little revenge cycle. So, like, he was a bit mm-hmm. stunted for a while because he was so caught up with, with his grief and his vengeance. And But then he'll have moments where he's really malleable again and really and really nimble and versatile. But Silver seems to have this even more. So this, to me, I guess this is part of my terror about the end of season three. Again, <laughs> again. 
I don't even know who I'm rooting for anymore. I, I honestly, right. do, I don't that's know who I'm really rooting for. Thing. That's, I mean, uh-huh. that's the beautiful thing here is that I'm terrified about, I mean, partly also because I know Treasure Island. So I'm right. terrified about the Silver Flint relationship. I have no idea. Like I perfect, I have the perfect amount of conflict. Like I completely mm-hmm. want both of them to be well and happy. And I know that probably neither of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're setting yourself into the sunset. Right. Um, yes. But I think part of what we're seeing here is not just that Silver, you know, what he demonstrated with Dobbs, but that ultimately Silver is in a way like the character that evol- is evolving the most, that is is capable sure. of the most evolution. Mm-hmm. Well, there's also the question of a third influence, which is this kind of phantom larger than life identity that Billy is, you know, building right. for him. Absolutely. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I like oh, yeah. that, that a lot. Gonna, is that right. going to exert even more influence than Maddie or Flint? You know, I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Because if there's anything that's going to pull him into that. Right. And F- Flint became lost to the manufactured identity. How will Silver deal with it? Right. 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 right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And then to you pull get him into... into that darkness that he thought felt so good. Right. Uh, combined oh, with this fame, man. with this story surrounding him. Right. With being both liked and feared more than any man he's ever known or seen. That could be very intoxicating to him and absolutely become the driving force. I think that's right. Right. Well, and that or could become be his hubris. Right? Because, uh, you know, Flint is burdened with his identity. I'm very curious if if the show will take us to a place where Silver feels the burden or if it will end before where it's still intoxicating to him. Oh, yeah. Cause that's right. Because they don't have to. Oh, no. They don't have to no. have any kind of real resolution. Oh, oh right. That's right. Because they get Go to have the to gap me. between this and There is the gap. Mm-hmm. Although, knowing them and the torment that they like to put us through. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to imagine Silver not ending. I mean, it's just, yeah. Okay. Again, getting into predictions. I, I but a sweet and, a bittersweet ending, but yes. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's hard for me to imagine, sure. like, anyone coming out of this, like, proper happy. Right. Yeah. I don't we think know, that's going We to know who we're us. dealing with here. Yes. Except, please tell me Adele and Featherstone will uh, open a bed oh. and breakfast together. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Have a baby. I know. <laughs> I, I want that now, too. <laughs> I want that more than anything. That would be oh, lovely. That's funny. I know. I just you, need them to survive and be okay. Would, wouldn't you totally go to their bread, bed and breakfast and like you'd like sit and have your coffee with Featherstone in the morning and Adele would be <laughs> saucy and Featherstone would try to make you really happy and it would be great. And then she'd oh. be just rolling her eyes in the corner. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Oh. I know. I adore her. And uh, I know that she would roll her eyes at me because I'm way too earnest for, for Adele's taste. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) oh i love that i love that oh yeah but there was something i wanted to bring up um i saw an interesting uh fan theory to the extent that black sales can have fan theories Uh unfortunately i do not recall who brought who this was i i can't take credit it's not mine but whoever uh brought this up it's very interesting so basically um the theory was that you know how the pirate song from treasure island um, the lyrics go 15 men on a dead man's chest. Mm-hmm. Oh. So the theory, the, and you know how Jack had that little speech about how Charles Vane sacrifices in that box. Um, so oh, the theory right, right. was that by the end of the series, there will be 15 characters whose deaths we can directly link to the events around that chest. Oh, oh God. Do you think that's true or do you think that's just kind of a, a theory? I sure like it. <laughs> uh, no, I was thinking if you think if we think about it, season four only needs to have five. There are there've already been ten. Uh let's see where I had it somewhere. Wow. Um, I was gonna really? say I wonder okay. what the number would have been. So who has there the been death so toll far? Is pretty high. Um so season one, Morley and Gates, even because even though their deaths didn't like directly link to the chest, they were a part of Flint's agenda. Sure. That, a visit that, to no, you know, and, and well so, and Jack specifically said Gates. Yeah, so Morley, Gates Randall, Miranda, mm-hmm. Muldoon, Dufresne, Mr. Scott, Charles Vane, Hornigold, and uh, Throckmorton. Jeez. That's 10. So you only yeah. need wow. five more. Wow. Certainly. Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, I like that. 
15 men on the dead man's chest. Yeah. All right. So we'll have to revisit that when we meet up for our season four wrap and see yeah. five. See, it's funny. When you said 15, that seemed like a crazy amount. Five no. seems sadly, tragically like too few. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like there's like, going like, to be, like, be more than that. be right. There's going to be more than that. Because <laughs> well, keep in mind, it doesn't necessarily have to be a major character. Like I was naming, you that know, Morley and Muldoon. So it could be, right. oh, I, right. I hope well, Joji doesn't die, but it could be someone like Joji and, you know, right. people like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. But see, okay. And we have characters like Joshua. Joshua is one of my favorite characters. I don't know right. if he died because that of that. True. Did he yeah. be on the list? So maybe it's 11 then and maybe we only need four more. Well, again, yeah. did Joshua die because of that? Joshua died when Vane's crew took over at Charlestown. Like, is, does that count? Does Throckmorton count? I'm not sure Throckmorton counts, honestly. Okay. Well, because he's a character he died that died as the first to the cause. But yeah, so I guess this list can be kind of flexible. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, true. I feel like it should be it should be characters who actually are on our side. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. We'll revisit this concept at the end and see if there's a list of 15 that really makes sense. Because I feel like Joshua doesn't really fit it, nor does Throckmorton in my eyes. I mean, because you. That I mean, sense. there are a lot of people that died. Like. Right. Also, also Dufresne. Dufresne didn't die really for the sake of the chest, although Silver killed him. So, like, I guess if 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 Throckmorton makes sense, then Dufresne makes sense too. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Let's revisit the concept. It would be interesting okay. if there were actually fifteen that we really feel like fit that that concept. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't put it past them. I certainly would not. I mean, that was one of the things I said, I guess, in our last episode was like, I just am so looking forward to just having a cascade of now Treasure Island reference Mm. stuff happening in this season. I think I feel like we're okay. I guess we're getting into predictions. then. Okay, let's do our prediction game. Okay, let's do it. Where are we starting? What I was thinking was that the three of us that will list characters and uh, each of us will make a prediction, and then I will write them down. And then when we do our season four wrap, we'll see who got the most right. Okay. All right. I like that. It's a contest. And it's going to be Lauren. So it's more than a game. <laughs> I predict that it's going to be Lauren. <laughs> yeah. Lauren's pretty good at this. Fair enough. I just want to preface by saying these are blind predictions a lot of oh, people think seem to right. think i like know everything about no, this show. No, no. Yes. Uh, whatever i say even if it's right i want to stress that i do not actually know so right. stars does not send pirates after me no 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 no. <laughs> all three of us we know nothing we are you know we are on the same plane as every single person who's mm-hmm. making predictions right now we just we've spent a lot of time with the show right feel like the three of us are pretty good at understanding what these writers are capable of doing sure. to us. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's based just on that, just on okay. knowing the show up until now and the people right. involved. Mm-hmm. I forgot what my general prediction was right now. I mean, other than our hearts will be broken. That's a general prediction that doesn't count for the game because, you know, anyone would say that. Anyone who's ever watched Black Sails would say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. All right, ladies, what's your prediction for let's do Adele and Featherstone? What's your prediction for Adele and Featherstone? Oh, you know, I think one of them bites it. I'm sorry. I hate to say, oh. but I think we're going to lose one of them. Uh, I don't you know. Want I'll say time. they will be our one ray of light and they'll survive. Yeah. Like they, they have to give us a tiny, tiny ray of light. And I think that will be the one ray of light. Okay. Oh, that okay i love it all right so lauren's going with the bed and breakfast liz you uh-huh. think one of them's gonna die one of them will bite it yeah which one? Oh, do i have to say which one okay i do i should get specific shouldn't i yeah yeah it doesn't really work as a prediction if we don't get specific i'm gonna say adele i think that that would be more emotional for featherstone than the reverse so I'm going to say Adele, just because they're going to want to really mess with us. Okay, I'm going to go the opposite re- for no real reason. I'm going to say Featherstone, because he's the most sympathetic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to agree that if one of them dies, I think it's going to be Featherstone, but I'm going to hold on to my one more right. light. All okay. right, Lauren's yep. going to be the, vo- the voice of optimism here. <laughs> Which is not usually the case. <laughs> I know. I know. That's why I'm liking it so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Jack and Anne. Oh, Jack and Anne. Okay. I think they're going to follow through with the season two. We'll be, we'll be partners till they put us in the fucking ground and she'll die with him. 
That would be beautiful. I think that's the best answer. Uh, do we have to disagree to make it the contest? Nope, nope or not we... at all. No, okay. no, not at all. Not oh, at all. But, or I could go with uh, my like one happy couple ending would be Jack dies and then Anne gets to sail away with Max and they're the one happy couple in the show. Oh, uh huh. Um, and like happy is a relative term because obviously yeah. Anne would still be very devastated by the loss of Jack. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm gonna say that. Jack would die in Anne's arms, but because of her awakening with Max, she is able to move forward when she would not have been able to before. Well, let me also say, because even though Jack most likely will die, because so far they have killed all the characters who historically die, right, they don't yeah. always kill them in the ways they historically die. That's like true. Ned Lowe, Ned Lowe was not beheaded by Charles Vane right. <laughs> historically. Um, yes. And Charles Vane, although he did hang, um, he hung after Jack, not before him. Right. So do you think Jack will die by hanging or do you think they'll kind of psych us out and he'll die in like battle or some other way? Oh, so I didn't know he was supposed to be hung. Well, oh. Yeah, because it's possible they'll change the method like they changed the Ned Lowe method. It's true. And they they changed the method of Hornigold's death, too, so... Yeah, I would think they would, just because the vein hanging was so dramatic. It seems like to do it again seems weaker somehow. Hmm. Although I feel like they have mm. set up a rivalry between him and uh, Rogers. I feel like he kind of like Rogers. True. That is Rogers kind of has to be the one to do it. But yeah. Oh God. Okay. See, so that's the only ray of sunshine. I'm I'm positive, and I've said this a few times that Jack is going to die. I do want some amazing conversation between the two of them right beforehand. Mm. So my prediction is that Anne will survive. Jack will, I guess if we're being specific, Jack is going to hang. Rogers is going to do it. And that we will have a conversation between Jack and Rogers. Yeah, that would be good. I like that answer. I like that too, but I guess just... No, I don't like it at all. I hate my answer. I don't (laughs) want Jack to die. (laughs) It's <laughs> uh, a horrible and answer. Jack and Anne to swing together. Ooh. I was going to say, I'm going to go with that line as being prophetic. I'm going to yeah. say together till they're in the fucking ground. Okay. Uh, I think that's good. I, I like, like that, that line. That's, that's my favorite answer. I frankly. like that slightly better, but I'm still sticking with yeah. my prediction. Uh, yeah. I think Jack and Anne hanging together is, whew, that's rough, but it's hard to beat. Okay. Eleanor and Rogers. And I guess I'm going to be more specific here. Do they betray each other? This is my this is my specific question. Does one of them betray the other? And if so, who? Uh, hmm. I feel like I can no longer say what Eleanor will and won't do. Cause I just feel like, <laughs> it's hard to say. I feel like my feelings about Eleanor are, you know how in season two, Jack says about Anne, um, either she's changed so much that I no longer recognize her or I never really knew her at all. Right. Um, I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing, but that's kind of what he says. That's how I feel about Eleanor. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, season three, just I do not know who she is anymore. So I, I'd like to think that she's been playing Rogers, but I don't think she is. Uh, so I think if any of them screws over the other, Rod, it's Rogers realizes that she has not been making smart decisions and does something about that. Right, and that's what I'm thinking is that it's less of a betrayal and more of a dawning realization that this is not a good partnership. Hmm. Although in Black Sales world, that generally leads to some sort of betrayal. That is true. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm going to, yeah. So it would be Rogers betraying Eleanor. All right. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with no betrayal. I think they're not going to betray each other. Yeah. I think they're going to stick, stick together. Happily until, ever after, huh? Well, no, I'm not saying that necessarily. Because I think, because <laughs> I think Eleanor is going to die. But, oh. but I don't oh. think they'll betray each other. Okay. Well, what's interesting is Mapleton's line, uh, about Eleanor being the kind of person who can only understand mm-hmm. herself through the eyes of em- enemies and selling oh, the seeds of her huh. destruction. That yep. seemed like a, like a very prophetic line that yes. will become important. Yes. I mean, she's definitely sown the seeds of her destruction, but at whose hands is the question and mm. how. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if Rogers has a hand in that or not. Yep. Agreed. I mean, except I, I'm predicting that he won't. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, Yeah. And then his, you know, history spoilers. Like I see, I don't know if Liz knows this. Like, do you know this? I, yeah, it's I so don't funny. know I, the history. I'm not the history pre- doesn't I'm count not pre- as a spoiler. So I okay, mean, okay. Well, Rogers, I just happen to not know. Well, uh, okay, maybe I won't say anything. 
Well, no, the <laughs> interesting thing, Rogers is kind of like Anne in that, not that his story is open-ended in history, it's not, but um, it Black Sails could choose to end right. on various points in his timeline. Right. Because uh, when he died, like, he was much older than he is on the show, but they could choose to, like, accelerate the events of his life. So mm-hmm. it'll be very interesting to see if they end it in a positive place in his life or a negative place in his life. I'll say that. Oh, okay. Interesting. All right. Huh. Okay. That's totally true. Right. Is that, so is that what you're thinking or no? No, not history's not, no, history's not a spoiler. I was just, yeah, doesn't matter. I was going to totally spoil things about his story again i don't know why i'm being protective of some people's historical stories and some so others funny. i feel yeah. like i feel like well because rogers is so significant in the history so i guess sure. i just did spoil it i mean in a way. <laughs> max see i'm gonna do max as a single because god knows what sh- yeah. what partnerships or pairings she's gonna have it's max impossible is to know absolutely gonna make it i think i think she's the ultimate survivor on this show um, but I also think if they kill Eleanor, they're not going to also kill Max. Uh, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think they'll kill. Especially if they kill Anne too. I don't think they kill yeah. all three of the main women. Well, I don't so. even mean like kill. I just mean like she makes it. Makes it. I think she's going to come out on top somehow or the other. And whether that's taking advantage of the situation as it happens, or but but I yeah I think that we'll see Max at the end higher than we've ever seen her before. Oh, okay. So you see Max on top. Yes. Yeah. See, this one's hard for me because I have a running theory in my mind that I've shared with no one about Max that uh-huh. I was that I'm waiting for the end of season four to see how it plays out, and then uh-huh. I'll know if my theory you shared works it with or me, not. Actually, I know what you're talking. Oh, about. Oh, I did share it with you. Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so I do have a running theory about Max, which makes it hard for me to predict because I feel like it's so open ended, and my theory will either work or not work based right. on how Max's story turns out. I think that Max will not end up on top. I think my prediction is mm. that Max will not end up on top. I think that she's going to learn how to be a whole person without oh. needing the things that she's seeking now, the things that have taken her down such a lonely, miserable road. So wow. I I actually am going to choose an optimistic end for Max, one in which she doesn't have the material wealth that she has right. currently, but that she actually has more personal happiness. Okay. I like that's that. my prediction for Max. Okay, I, ha- I have a Max theory that kind of fits your theory, Liz, about how she'll be on top. Mm-hmm. I don't think they'll do this though because of your interview with Luke, where he was emphasizing emphasizing uh, Maddie. But yeah. uh, my theory was that because <laughs> right. all we know about Treasure Island is that he has a wife of African descent. That's it. Oh, so a lot of- before Maddie was on the show, everyone thought Max was the contender. Yeah. Oh, I so definitely fine. thought that. Right. My theory is that that is still not out of the question. They could be faking us out with Maddie. She could die, and that would be very shocking because no one, you, mm-hmm. you know, a shocking right. punch. And then, so then Max is the one who ends up being Silver's wife in the end. That's very possible. Interesting. And she's the one who manages his finances. They have an understanding that could lead to an unusual love, and the show does like unusual love. Oh, yeah. Loves. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. they do. Absolutely, they do. Interesting. Okay. Theory. I like this. Okay. It's a, it's a little elaborate, so I'm not, I'm not sure. It is a little that. elaborate, but that's okay. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> the best theories are. Uh, I think we'll skip Teach. Uh, we will go now to Silver and Flint. What is our prediction? Oh, <laughs> I think Silver completely usurps Flint. Um, in the in the book, of course, in Treasure Island, we just mm-hmm. hear that Flint died in his room in Havana. Mm-hmm. So I think that he is completely undone in the end, and and basically destitute. And Silver rises as King of the Pirates. Do you think they'll take it to Flint's death or stop it before that? I don't think they will take it to his death. Just to, or rather not to his literal death, but to his figurative mythological mm-hmm. death. Yeah, I pretty much I, agree. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this one got this one basically got canceled Here. out because we all agree. I'm going to yeah. add to it that I think that Silver will end up. I mean, again, he's not this in in Treasure Island, but I think that we may end in a place where Silver is isolated and lonely, but we see the route that he'll take to become his Treasure Island kind of beloved of his men self again. But Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a good chance that we will end this story with Silver mirroring Flint. 
that's why you know it could go either way though silver could could so like i said just like super duper be the person of evolution and become like and integrate so many different characteristics that he could end up actually fine which would be mm -hmm. both of those versions would be super sad. Like it would be super sad yeah. if if Silver pushes Flint out and it is and that is tormented by it. It would also be really sad if Silver pushes Flint out and Silver's just fine and Flint is miserable. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which of those to pick. <laughs> I feel like I'll be very surprised if it's the second. If Silver's like smirking, walking away from Flint, I would be very shocked if that was the case. Yeah, I think well, you're and right. especially I can't well, that. especially our big discussion about the end of season three. Like, right, what... exactly. Like, I think when Flint takes that hard fall at the hands of Silver, I think that Silver will grieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we're all in agreement about that. So that essentially, for the sake of the game, got canceled out. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we're terrible yeah. at this game. <laughs> no, no, we 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 disagreed on some things, or we yeah. chose different options on some things. We'll be able to play the game. Well, do we all think Eleanor will die or no? I think I Eleanor will die. I don't necessarily think so. I hope she will die. I, think... <laughs> I hope she'll die. <laughs> okay, Sorry. that's a season <laughs> four wish, not a season four prediction. That's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Not, not only because of uh, how, how her storyline is gone, but also because the show has so far set up that everyone, every action has a reaction and everyone mm -hmm, must sure. answer to their mistakes. Yeah, there's always consequences. Oh, He's like oh, made yeah. so many. It would be totally, I think it would be kind of ridiculous for it, the show to let her off the hook for them. Mm. Like if Flint doesn't get off the, let off the hook, if Vane doesn't, if Silver right. doesn't, you know, why should she? Right. I don't know. I think there's something interesting and compelling that, though, if, if she does it, if she does get to just walk away scot free, oh, and just God, well, let that would be that a disdain very dismal and message. hatred for her right. just remain. That right. would make me displeased, and I think a lot of viewers too. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, but also, I just want to bring up the thing I said. I don't know. At some point, when we talked about Flint's fate, that I always say that there are things worse than death. Mm hmm. Sure. That that the, she could survive and still have consequences. I think she's going to yeah. die. That's my that's mm -hmm. my inter that's my prediction. Is I think she's going to die, or she could change. Like she says, she wants to. She could stop being that person. She could. Yeah. Although, again, she, she hung just vain, and that was an unjust yeah. act. So yeah, it's true. Now, in her mind, she thought it just, though. Don't forget that. I, she went through a lot of narrative, self-narrative contortions sure. to get there. Um, sure. But she believed I it, I think. I don't, you know, I'm not positive she did. Really? Even in that cell with him? In that cell with him, she did. But standing there watching it happen, she seemed uh, very conflicted. Interesting. Okay. And the message we got over and over again was just Max being so sad and disappointed. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, we will just, yeah. Yeah. El this Eleanor is, is the wish. wild card for us. I feel like I just, yeah. yeah. This is another wish, maybe and not a prediction, but you know, cause Jack wants to kill her. Teach wants to kill her. Mm. I hope that she dies at Max's hand. I think that would be fascinating. <gasps> oh, that would be, oh my God. Wouldn't that be cool? and unexpected. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I like that. Damn. Okay, I have another. I have another question for predictions. Mm -hmm. Jack said, "I'll be our Charles Vane. Who uh -huh. will actually be our Charles Vane? No one can replace him. Yeah. No oh, one can Lauren, replace come Vane. on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, but I guess it's because okay. Yeah, nobody can him. replace him. Who will come closest to being our Charles Vane? <laughs> I mean, like it's got to be." silver doesn't it to have that kind of weight well, that luke, comes with his name luke definitely hinted at that i, I it's i'm predicting it's going to be Anne. i think it's going to be Anne. oh interesting okay i, I well, think that Anne's, yeah, Anne's always right been. this is why i love the hair thing i think it's going to be Anne because i feel like Anne's arc has been subtle and a little bit underneath the radar i mean there were moments yeah. obviously where it was really where it was really striking I I believe and and again I'm torn actually between it being Anne and being Billy. I, think I was thinking Anne, about Billy too. Yeah. Anne and Billy are our two characters that their arc has sometimes been more dramatic, but mostly under the radar. I think that yeah. for both of them, season four is going to be the season where we're like, 
holy shit, this is what all of this yeah. was leading to. Interesting. Well, do you mean I'll be your Charles Vane? Like, what aspects of Charles Vane are you talking about? Like, kind of his reputation and respect? That's what or the I was way, thinking. the way he operates in the narrative, kind of like moving the plot. Like, you're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. But when I think about his thought process, uh... I think his archetype. He will, who will archetypally yeah. be be Vane, mm -hmm. which is see, this is the difference between this is why you and I are such great pairing, Lauren, for talking about stuff because <laughs> you think about stuff like that, about uh -huh. like who's going to move the pr plot and stuff like that, and I think about like archetypes right <laughs> well, no, but, 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 like, the they're not unrelated so they're not unrelated <laughs> but that's the way i look at it like who's going to fill his place emotionally for people for people but but for viewers or for people on the show or both both yeah i i hope it's Zan. that would be amazing because mm -hmm. my wish for every season more screen time for ann bonnie yeah <laughs> i think pretty much. i feel like another okay i'll uh, throw in another season for a prediction i think you're gonna get yeah I think we are too. I feel like the end of season three kind of hinted at both of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously not Jack. He can say it, but right. that, <laughs> that's not the place <laughs> that Jack's going to play. Um, but he's just not that person. But Anne has always been a great parallel for Vane. And Billy has had moments of that, but certainly yes. that whole that whole eye contact exchange and the nodding was, was a a passing, passing, passing uh -huh. yeah, passing the mantle. Uh, but I still nice. think it's Anne. I was going to say, Nick, also because Billy's arc is has to take him in a direction that's much darker than Vane. Um, oh, just to see where he lands. Well, yeah. it's, easy, it's easy to not go down a dark road when somebody, you know, kills you halfway through your story. Vane is a pure soul, and that was always his role in various, mm -hmm. in various iterations of that thing. But Billy has always also been a pure soul. The difference will be that he survives. Mm -hmm. So I feel like pretty much anyone who's going to survive this story has to go down dark roads. I, yeah. I feel like as much as I still hold on to this idea that this show is basically an optimistic show, I do believe strongly that this show has a kernel of optimism about the mm -hmm. human spirit. At the same time, this show requires of characters to survive, to to become darker versions of themselves yeah but the optimism is based in the fact that even though they become darker versions of themselves they always do it for reasons that they believe are oh, just mm -hmm. and I that like that's that. the essential the essential optimism here is about mm -hmm. intent not about uh, necessarily what I people really end like up that. doing but what uh -huh. they want to do who they want to be and what they want to be doing right. is always based in goodness even though the sad thing is that that goodness often leads them down sad mm -hmm. dark horrible roads uh, that's rough and their <laughs> own downfall <laughs> yes because uh -huh. they're tragic heroes and i love them for it <laughs> <laughs> um sorry Got, went, went, went a little sideways with that prediction. <laughs> <laughs> will 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 NASA still be in the hands of pirates at the end? <laughs> uh, right. No, I'm joking. <laughs> That's, not, <laughs> That's no, it's not actually up for debate. How many major characters do you think are going to die? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Or is, is that too dark? We don't, no, no, we don't no, have... no. Of course not. <laughs> is that too dark? We talk about <laughs> black sails. <laughs> Well, I think we have to, I mean, we did that a little bit when we went character by character. So we're talking about more characters other than the ones we went through specifically. Oh, no, just in general, like how many, like, you know, not the Adele and Featherstone, but of like Flint, right. Silver, Billy, mm -hmm. um, and okay, Jack. Well, okay, well, we can list who we think will die. I mean, I guess for me, it's really Jack and Eleanor, I'm predicting, will die. That seems so few. That does seem like few. Jack. I mean, Billy, we know, obviously not. Right. Silver, not. Uh-huh. Flint, I don't believe so. I don't think we're going to see him die. I think we're going to see his, you know, his reach some horrible depth of right. existence Rock while bottom, still living. Certainly. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, I Max, know. I think will survive. I think I Max will have to survive. I'm predicting that Anne will survive, but I don't know. Yeah, I really I think we choosing... might lose Jack and Anne. I think we might lose oh. them together. I think I think that Lauren's no, that's... right. Right. Okay, I'm still sticking with my prediction of no, and we'll just see how that plays <laughs> okay. out. I'm willing. I'm. Yeah. I am okay with being wrong. I'm going to stick stick with my guns here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I do think that Eleanor will die. So yeah, I, yeah, I was Jack say and Eleanor. three is always a good number, and it's a good storytelling number too. So I want to say that we're going to lose three major characters, but I'm not as clear on who they are. I'm just not. I think you're right, but you're forgetting a uh, teach. He's got to go. I was going to say teach. I was oh, wondering. I don't know my right, history. We didn't. But we didn't. Right. Oh, okay. I would say it's Jack like, and Anna. It's not even history. It's a you know in the duel episode he talks about how he has a bullet. Right. Oh, right, that's right. right. That's right. So he's got, kind of a, he's, it's like he's a got yeah, he's going. Thing. He's right. going. They right, right, right. That, so they have to do something with it. Well, yeah. and you know, he's and going. he was he's he dead. was he talked about himself in relation to clocks. Oh yes. Yeah, that man's <laughs> exactly. dead. He's a doornail. Okay. So... Chekhov's Chekhov's clock. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Right. I predict Jack <laughs> and Teach and Eleanor. Okay. And with that prediction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's no fun if we but, agree. But I'm but I'm adding Anne to it. I think I have to say I had okay. Anne too. Yeah, so that's four. All yeah, right, four. so I'll be okay. So it'll be Jack two against Anne one, teach. and I'll go with the three. I don't. Right, I, I don't think, think I think that we're going to lose Eleanor though. So I'm going to say Jack and Anne and Teach. Uh, and I feel like there'll probably be one more actually though, because they're such a threesome. But I can't think who that person would be. So. Oh right, if it's Jack and Anne and Teach, then all three of them die. Yeah. I mean, again, I. Yeah. I mean, there's more minor characters. I think DeGroote's going to die. I was going to say, we're going to get some... Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot DeGroote, of minor character deaths. Yeah. So like, it's going to be like the seventh Harry long. Potter. We're just right. like, you right, just right. keep on losing people. Yeah, no, DeGroote has to die because yeah. he's been so, like, he's always the voice of doom. He's there and he's loyal. Oh, like, how could he... How could, how could DeGroote <sighs> not die? Yeah. <laughs> After, like, always mm. saying the worst thing's going to happen. DeGroote has to die... Oh, I hope maybe Joji our new die. storyteller guy. What was his name? Jacob. Jacob will die. Yes, Jacob, I think yeah. Jacob will die. Yeah, we'll oh, lose yeah, yeah, some people for die. sure. Okay, we know Ben Gunn won't die. Right. Um, who else? The do Queen. We love? I bet the Queen dies. Oh God, yes, the Queen dies. Oh right, and wait, Lauren, you predicted perhaps. So, what do we think about Maddie? Is Maddie going to die? Perhaps Maddie, and they're faking us out with, you know, Silver's yeah. African wife, and I it's don't actually think so, nice. Though. I just Shit. can't. I need those I don't two want to Maddie it. to die. That's my yeah. happy. No, I think you are right, especially with how much thing. Luke was emphasizing Maddie, unless he was right. himself being crafty. Yeah. Um, which he is capable which of. Which I wouldn't we, put we, past him. He's a smart guy. Yep. But yeah. Yep. Exactly. Uh, I don't want Maddie to die. But yes, the queen will die. I think the queen yeah, will die. Yeah, the queen will die, and I think that Maddie will not. Hmm. Okay, my last question. Uh huh. <laughs> Will Joji speak? Oh, I hope so. Oh, wouldn't that be excellent? Just one line? You know what? I bet he has a, a last dying word. <laughs> I want it to be in English and I want it to be in perfect English. Like, I want uh, Joji to just like speak perfect English after yes. all of this not talking. That would be funny. Yeah. I want the last line of the whole series to just be Joji saying hello. And that's it. <laughs> End. Wow, Lauren, that's so not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> no, so not that show. <laughs> See, I want that to be, I mean, not that they do outtakes, but wouldn't it be fun if that was like some sort of outtake of just like right. the whole thing ending and then Joji just be like, hey. What's up? Yes. (laughs) All right. All right. Now we're just getting silly. All right. So listeners, I am going to figure out some way to make this into a game for everyone. So stay tuned. I'm going to figure Mm -hmm. out something to make this a fun game for everyone. I'm going to have you all do predictions as well. Um, And then we can all tally up after season four and see how incredibly wrong we were because... (laughs) Exactly. Which is the fun of it, really. Which is the fun of it because... the last one standing. I know. Wouldn't that be... I know. And he'll say something quippy. (laughs) That would be fabulous. That would be fabulous. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't that show either. Um... (laughs) All right. So to wrap things up, I wanted to, I wanted Lauren, I know you have a lot of fun things coming up. So I wanted you to tell us what we have to look forward to over in your world in inverse.com. Oh yeah. I have like almost a comical amount of things, but a great amount of things. Um, Okay. So I have an interview with the creators, um, which will come out in early to mid January. I have, 
I, at Comic Con, I made a series of three video interviews with the Ooh. cast. Um, and so those are going to come out in the three weeks leading up to the show. Mm hmm. The first one will come out the week of January 9th, I think, um, towards the end of that week. And that's going to be with um, Luke Arnold and Tom Hopper. Then the second Great. one will come out that, the week after that and be with the ladies, um, Hannah New, Clara Paget, and Jessica Parker Kennedy. And then the third one will be with all of them. Wow. I've known for a while that these videos existed, and I'm so excited to see them. Yeah, that's going to be <laughs> so much fun. Liz, all I'll say is that some of the stuff that Tom said actually made me laugh and distinctly think of you. Ooh. So. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited now. Specifically made to delight me. That's oh, wonderful. But, uh, so the videos, because um, you know how the official Black Sales account has released some videos and they're usually like two minutes long or whatever? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, so our video editor guy is going to cut them down to like two minute long segments. However, because I was like, you know, you know videos, you do your thing. However, right. I know these fans and these fans will watch the whole thing. They'll so, watch all of it, so, yeah. Yeah, so I'm also going to release, like, the raw, unedited versions that yeah. are, like, uh, 10 to 20 minutes long. So you Do guys it. Can see the whole thing. I'll watch it. Absolutely. Oh, how fun. Yeah, they're fun. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, and then um, for everyone who loves Zach McGowan, I actually uh -huh. will have an interview with him coming out. Um, it's actually more on his whole career, but Black mm -hmm. Sails is part of his career. Absolutely. Um, so that will come out... Uh, Coincidentally, his new show is airing, like, right around the time that Black Sails airs. Oh, okay. uh, Thank you both networks. Very handy. Um, so that will come out around then. Awesome. Yay. That's so exciting. Um, yeah, then, that's great. More to yeah, look there, forward to. There will be some other things, but I don't want to announce anything that has not been, like, confirmed yet. Sure. Like everything I've Everything sure. I've told you about has, like, already been done, already exists. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's going to be a lot of fun. How exciting! Okay, basically, it's just going to be a really, really fun month up until like we're that's it. We're 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 almost a month away from the airing from the beginning of season four. It's going to be a fun <laughs> month. It's really going to be a great month. Yeah, and I'm so excited to see uh, or to listen to your future interviews as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're pretty excited, excited, excited about them. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again for having me. You know, I'm always down to talk black sales. Ready to guns. Full compliment. Okay. All right, Liz. Well, that was so much. That was so much fun chatting with Lauren. We let Lauren go because we do have a very long list of uh -huh. people who got our last thesis statement correct. Um, I don't have a list here, but you do. So... I do. Yeah. So I can jump on with it. And that's fine. Yeah. And I will let everybody know that I'm going off of the spreadsheet that was made for us by our uh, Captain Silver, Silver Sue O'Shandy. Yes. So, thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. If it's accurate because right. I haven't updated it. I don't know if you've updated it, Daphne, or or how. I uh, have not. So, yes, okay, tell well, us I if we get it wrong anyway. <laughs> so, if it was accurate, then this is accurate. And otherwise, whoops, and our mistake. So, uh, the first we have Chum Bucket Charlie. According to the spreadsheet, Chum Bucket Charlie is owed a ship and then just got one for last week's thesis statement. So two ships for Captain Chum Bucket Charlie, the Marlin and the Hammerhead. I gave you big fish because, you know, you throw Chum out into the water and you catch something. So yeah, you got a Marlin and a Hammerhead. I like it. <laughs> and of course, Captain O'Shandy herself has a new ship and she's already got the Sterling and the Tourmaline. Ah, uh, and I think she's also got the manatee because she took that one, right? No, I think she gave it back. To she gave Jeff. it back. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, now she has the Alexandrite. <gasps> Lovely, mm -hmm. and it, and it's a beautiful stone. It and is a beautiful name. stone. I know, my favorite. Okay, and uh, quick, click Clark. She also she already has the Lone Star, so I'm giving her the Alamo. Hmm. And then Carla, who is our Portuguese man of war, is made bosun. So congratulations, Carla. Congratulations, Carla. And Jeff now gets a pirate name. This is his first yeah. pirate name because it's the first time he's actually played along. I so know. Jeff, Jeff tore through all of the seasons to be able to finally participate in the thesis game with us. So, so we love you, Jeff. So Jeff is at Bubacus on Twitter. So his pirate name is Beardicus. <laughs> that is fantastic. 
fantastic. I really like it. Bubicus Beardicus. I like it a lot. Uh, okay. So, and then uh, Megan, who is our dagger eyed dame, also got a promotion to bosun, uh, as did Esmeralda Salt. So, congratulations, ladies. And then we have a new Megan, Here Be Megan, on Twitter, who gets a pirate name of Hawkeye to Gallant. I Ooh, like that one too, right? I like Pretty it cool. too. Scorpion Pierce gets a promotion to Quartermaster. Congratulations. Uh, another new player, Laura, who already has a pirate name for her Twitter handle, which is <laughs> Old Long John. So I gave her something completely different. She's now Blackheart McGinty. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's fabulous. And uh, Stormy Morley gets a new uh, ship, the Hurricane. Wow. Stormy Morley, you are you are formidable she at this point with your with a your fucking fleet right now. I it's know, amazing. seriously, yes. Uh, and then Red Handed Jen, who is a roller derby goddess, if you didn't know, gets the Amazon Queen. Oh my goodness, so appropriate, very appropriate. Oh, that's fantastic. And that's everybody. That I think should and catch that's... us up. If I missed you, do let me know. Hit us up on Twitter. We'll fix it. We will correct our error. Okay, Absolutely. and. And we now, we're, we really are on a countdown to season four, and we have treats yes. for you every single week. Mm -hmm. And um, just stay tuned. Yep. Every Monday, we're going to have a really fun podcast for you. Yeah. Some of them are super exciting for us. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. We're going to be bringing you some good stuff, some good people, some lots yeah. of behind-the-scenes information yeah. that's going to be very exciting for everybody. Exactly. So yeah, behind the scenes and analysis of of the first three seasons, mm -hmm. and that'll get us ready. So join Twitter if you haven't, because I will be posting something about our season four prediction game. We'll have mm -hmm. we'll do something fun with that. I haven't quite figured out how it's going to work, but it'll be super fun. And then yeah, once we get to season four, we will be doing live tweets of each episode. Very exciting. And, uh -huh. and and we will be dropping our episodes uh, that same night, if not directly yeah. after the actual episode airs, too, so that you can hear what we have to say about it. It's going to be so exciting. <laughs> it is. I know. I'm excited. I'm very excited. Okay. Well, with that being said, until next week, from Common Room Radio, I am Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.